Psalm 66 is a beautiful psalm, giving us a lot of instruction on how we should praise God. You'll see as we get into the psalm. We see in the title of the psalm, and when I say the title, I mean the portion of the Hebrew text that in the English Bibles, particularly here I'm talking about the New King James Version, which in the English Bibles comes before verse 1, the title of this psalm, Psalm 66, is To the Chief Musician, a Song, a Psalm. Now, just like Psalm 65, it's described as being both a song and a psalm. What's unusual about Psalm 66, at least as it's arranged in the collection of the Book of Psalms, is that it is the first psalm since Psalm 50, that is not specifically attributed to David as being the author, but it's to the chief musician who is one of the music leaders or choir leaders or worship leaders of the people of Israel among the priests and the Levites, or the chief musician may be a reference to God himself, because really it is God is the one who invented music. And if there's ever a chief or greatest musician in all the universe, of course, it's God himself. There's an interesting comment that I found in Charles Spurgeon's great commentary on the book of Psalms called The Treasury of David. Uh, Spurgeon quotes a man named Daniel Cresswell, who says this, quote, This psalm is said to be recited on Easter Day by the Greek church. It is described in the Greek Bible as a psalm of the resurrection and may be understood to refer in a prophetic sense to the regeneration of the world through the conversion of the Gentiles. Interesting how this psalm has really a view for God's praise to be exalted in all the earth. So let's take a look at this Psalm 66, starting now with the first two verses where we read this. Make a joyful shout to God all the earth. Sing out the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Now, as in the previous psalm, Psalm 65, Psalm 66 not only has Israel in view, but as it says there in the very first line, all the earth. Did you see that? Make a joyful shout to God, all the earth. The psalmist understood that God was not only God over Israel, but also over the whole world. And it was good and even appropriate for the psalmist to call everyone to joyfully praise God. You know, there's something to be said for joyful praise of God. And we're not saying that there's never a place for a more serious or the occasional sort of somber or reflective tune sung unto the Lord. But there should be something fundamentally joyful about our praise of God. God has done so much for us, and especially we know this in even a way that the psalmist could not know it, because we know it on this side of the glorious person and work of Jesus Christ as revealed to us in the New Testament. We have even more reason to make a joyful shout to God and to sing out the honor of his name and to make his praise glorious, as it says here. Now, if you look at that line in verse 2, he says, make his praise glorious. Understand, Song or singing is not the only way to praise God, but is certainly one of the chief ways. That's why he says there in verse 2, sing out the honor of his name and, and do it in a way that makes God's praise glorious. Now, again, this is something that we need to think about and let it very practically inform the way that we praise God. We are to sing out the honor of his name. Listen, that's talking about singing with strength, singing with vigor, singing with heart behind it. Sing out the honor of his name speaks to us of singing in an energetic sense, not a very mild, passive whisper of song unto the Lord. No, but to sing out the honor of his name. And then I love that last line of verse two, don't you? To make his praise glorious. Now, listen, I if you do praise the Lord in song, for example, when our churches gather together as congregations, and I hope that you do, it should be more than a whisper. And look, maybe you don't have the best singing voice. I know that I certainly don't. Nevertheless, there's a way that we can sing with heart and energy and honor unto the Lord. And let me just be very straightforward with you. I'm not trying to offend anybody here, but I need to be honest with you. It doesn't really matter if you enjoy it or not. Can't you see from Psalm 66 that God enjoys it? 
And the purpose of our praise, the purpose of our worship is to give honor and glory unto him. It's not fundamentally to please ourselves. And so this is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to make his praise glorious. And this is the great opportunity that we have to gloriously praise God and to do it in song. Uh, Once again, I want to remind us, I said it before, but I don't mind saying it again. Singing is not the only way to praise God, but it certainly is an important way as it is revealed to us here in the book of Psalms and throughout the scriptures. All right, now verses three and four, he's telling us how to praise God. I love these two verses. He says, say to God, how awesome are your works? Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you. All the earth shall worship you and sing praises to you. They shall sing praises to your name, Selah. Again, don't you love verses three and four? Because it's as if after reading the first two verses where we're told to sing out to the Lord, to sing to the honor of his name, to make his praise glorious, you almost anticipate someone asking the psalmist, what do I say? How do I honor God? And he says, I'm glad you asked that. Let me tell you, look at the first line of verse three, say to God, how awesome are your works? This is a great place to do it. We need to say these things to God. The psalmist here gives very practical guidelines for those who want to praise God, those who want to speak out unto the Lord honor and praise, but maybe need a little bit of specific guidance as to what to say. Now, please, the psalmist is not intending that we take this in a mechanical or unfeeling way. How awesome are your works Through the greatness of your powers, your enemies shall submit themselves. No, we're not talking about some mechanical, unfeeling way. But what this is, is this is a necessary help to our hearts that truly want to praise God. But sometimes we need some instruction, some help as to how we should praise God. And it all begins with this what you say to God. Those are the first three words of verse three. Say to God. This concerns words that we actually speak. Now, let me make this clear. There is a place for unspoken praise. Matter of fact, back in verse one of Psalm 65, we saw that idea of unspoken praise. There's a place for that. But spoken praise unto God must not be neglected. In other words, just thinking about God is not enough, even though it's good. I'm not saying your thinking about God is bad. Your thinking of worshipful thoughts and prayerful thoughts and praising thoughts. And that's wonderful, but it's not enough. You also need to speak forth his praises. And if you don't know what to say, take the words of verses three and four, beginning with this great phrase, how awesome are your works? You might begin to praise God by thinking upon the greatness of his work in creation, salvation, and restoration. Lord, these are all awesome works that you've done. How awesome are your works? And then you continue on to recognize the great power of God. Look at how verse 3 continues. Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you. You see, this is the power of God that brings forth the awesome works that were just mentioned in the previous line. Now, this awesome and powerful God has enemies. Do you see that line in verse three? Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you. But through his great power, those enemies will be conquered and they themselves will be brought to submit themselves to God. What we're doing here is we're praising God for the triumph of his power over all of his enemies. Now, there are many commentators who note that the sense of that line here, that your enemies shall submit themselves to you. Again, I don't read the original Hebrew, so I can't detect these things. But from the commentators I read, they say that there's a sense of an insincere, unwilling submission to God noted here. In other words, they're submitting themselves to God, but because they have to. And I wonder if this isn't a little bit of the sense that we see later in the scriptures in Philippians chapter two, verses 10 and 11. Do you remember those two verses? It says this, that at the name of Jesus, 
Every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, even if this submission, even if this praise is reluctant or fundamentally insincere, they will still offer it, recognizing who God is. But at the end of it all, look at verse 4. It's wonderful. All the earth shall worship you. God may be praised in the recognition of his ultimate triumph over all the earth and in his worthiness to receive the worship and the praises that they rightly bring to him. Because did you see that line in verse 4? They, meaning all the earth, they shall sing praises to your name. Now, understand this. Sing praises to your name. In the thinking of the ancient Jews, the name was more than just a word. It was a true identifier. It was an indication of character. And this speaks of something greater than the grudging submission that was maybe suggested by the previous lines. When it says, they shall sing praises to your name, that indicates that they know at least something of the nature and the character of God. And this great turning to God with praise, notice here, of all the nations, all the earth, as it says there in verse 4, all the earth shall worship you, they shall sing praises to your name, that is worthy of a pause for reflection, a selah. They're praising God in light of his character, in light of his name, in light of who he is, the greatness of his person. Now, we're going to continue on with this great atmosphere of praise, now addressing verses 5, 6, and 7, where we read, Come and see the works of God. He is awesome in his doing toward the Son of Men. He turned the sea into dry land. They went through the river on foot. There we will rejoice in him. He rules by his power forever. His eyes observe the nations. Do not let the rebellious exalt themselves. Selah. Now, I wonder if the psalmist felt that maybe other people were being kind of slow to think of God's awesome works. After all, way back in verse 3, he said that we should all say to God, how awesome are your works? And maybe we've had trouble thinking of his awesome works. So now he's going to help us out. He's going to describe for us, look at here in verse 5, how awesome he is in his doing towards the sons of men. He says, come and see this. Look. I'm going to take you by the hand and I'm going to show you the goodness of God as it's been displayed in history. And look for the example he gives here in verse 6. He says, He turned the sea into dry land. They went through the river on foot. The, the, the psalmist, when he's looking for the awesome works of God, he's turning to the holy history of the scriptures and he's remembering how God showed his power in bringing Israel through the Red Sea, that's in Exodus chapter 14, and through the Jordan River, that's in Joshua chapter 3. Now, it's interesting. He's considering these two things. He turned the sea into dry land, that's crossing the Red Sea, and they went through the river on foot, that's the River Jordan. The psalmist could have picked anything to describe the works of God but he chose two events that show how God participates in human affairs. The God of all power, he's not a passive observer, but he's an active participant in the affairs of man. And what we see from that, we say here in verse 6, there we will rejoice in him. And don't you love that? He says, we. He's identifying himself with Israel hundreds of years before his time. It's as if he was there. Yeah, we crossed the Red Sea. Now, you almost feel like telling the psalmist, listen, you weren't there. This happened 400 years before you were born. You weren't there. It goes, oh no, I was there. I am part of that great company of the faithful, the, the company of God's people that, that, that transcends every generation and every century. We will rejoice in him. And I love out phrases there, verse six, there we will rejoice in him. I was there at the Red Sea. I was there beside the Jordan River. 
there, that's where it happened. It wasn't a legend. It wasn't a myth, but there is where it happened. And then he says, therefore, we will rejoice in him. I love what Alexander McLaren, he said it in his commentary on the book of Psalms in the Expositor's Bible. It's in three volumes. And uh, in that, Alexander McLaren, that great Scottish preacher who lived and ministered in London, he said this, God's work is never antiquated. It is all a revelation of eternal activities. What he has been, he is. What he did, he does. Therefore, faith may feed on all the records of old time and expect the repetition of all that they contain. Brothers and sisters, we were there. We will rejoice in what God did there. And and so he goes on here, verse 7. His eyes observe the nations. Again, he's giving us reason to praise God. He's declaring his awesome works. The, The psalmist called all the earth to observe the great works of God and to give him praise. And it was worth remembering that he observes the nations and that they should look up in praise to the one who looks down upon them. But there's a lesson in this. Verse 7. Do not let the rebellious exalt themselves. You see, in light of God's power, in light of his participation in human affairs, and in light of his eye upon the world, to be rebellious against him is foolish. To exalt yourself against him is madness. And that's why this, again, is worthy of a pause for reflection. We see it there at the end of verse 7, a selah a pause. Think about it. Maybe listen to the music that goes along with this psalm and think about that wonderful idea that it's foolish for us to exalt ourselves against God. Now, continuing on verses 8 through 12, he's going to give us more reasons to praise God. He says this, Oh, bless our God, you peoples, and make the voice of his praise to be heard, who keeps our soul among the living and does not allow our feet to be moved. For you, O God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. You brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our backs. You have caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, but you brought us out to rich fulfillment. Oh, this is so powerful in stressing to us how we can praise God and for what reasons we should praise and bless God. He's putting the focus on the Lord and all the things he've done, even the mysterious things that God has done. Let me explain. Verse 8, he says, Oh, bless our God, you peoples. So the psalmist here is repeating his exhortation to all the earth, telling them to praise the God of Israel. And he's going to give them many reasons to do so. Now, I just want to say before we come to the following verses, please remember here that verse 8 reminds us that the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, while the focus is on Israel, no doubt, God's desire was to work in Israel and through Israel to reach the whole world, to all you peoples, to all the earth. And so he says, listen, I'm going to tell you how to praise God. This is what God does. Verse 9, who keeps our soul among the living. God preserves his people. He gives them life and a secure position. And by the way, since this is being written from the perspective of Israel, has not God done that miraculously for the Jewish people time and time again? Their soul has been kept among the living. God has not allowed their feet to be moved. And then he continues on, even though, verse 10, for you, O God, have tested us. Now, God blesses his people, but sometimes the blessing is found in a difficult testing. So the psalmist praised God for life and secure position. That's in verse 9. But he also recognizes the hardships of life. He expressed the hardships and testing with many vivid word pictures in verses 10 and 11. Are you ready for these word pictures? Number one, you have refined us as silver is refined. It's as if he's saying, 
Lord, we feel the heat rising until we have no strength or stability, but we're melted. That that impure dross rises to the top and God, the refiner, he expertly scrapes it away, knowing that the silver is pure enough when he can see his own reflection in our melted metal. He's like a refiner, refining silver. Then secondly, verse 11, you've brought us into the net. We felt the freedom of being able to swim wherever we pleased. And life was full of options and choices. And suddenly that freedom seems gone and our choices became few. Verse 11, you laid affliction on our backs. We used to walk easy and carefree as if we didn't have a single burden in the world. But now our backs are loaded with affliction. And we find the weight difficult to bear. Verse 12 now. You've caused men to ride over our heads. We used to stand in battle and fight on an equal footing with our enemies, if not even better footing than they. But then we were cast down and we felt them riding in triumph over us. Where once we seemed to only know victory, now we know the sting of defeat. It says there in verse 12, we went through fire and water. We feel that we've been through it all and it feels that no adversity has been kept from us. Now, all of that is a dramatic, poetic, beautiful, powerful description of adversity. All those things that the people of God have felt and sometimes continue to feel. But don't miss the end of verse 12. Here he simply says, but, and by the way, this is one of the Beautiful uses of that single word, but, in the scriptures. But you brought us out to rich fulfillment. The psalmist said to God that he understood that in some ultimate sense, their affliction was from you. It was allowed by God himself. And as they continued to trust in God, God vindicated himself. God vindicated their trust, not only delivering them from difficulty, but even bringing them out to rich fulfillment. And that rich fulfillment would never have come apart from the many difficulties. Brothers and sisters, this is an Old Testament stating of the principle that we find in Romans chapter 8. All things work together for good for those who know God, for those who love God, I should say, and those who are called according to his purpose. This is the great blessing that we have in Jesus Christ, that that even Israel knew as they submitted to the lordship of Yahweh over their lives. Now, we remind ourselves that this is in a list of giving all the earth reasons why God should be praised. And we might think that if we want people to praise God, we should hide the difficult times that we have. We should hide the fact that there's times when God either truly or at least seems to test us and that we face difficulty. And sometimes it seems to be from him. Maybe we should hide all that. But the psalmist described life lived for God as it really is. And he knew that understanding God as he really is, that will draw men and women to praise. Brothers and sisters, we do not have to present God to the world as if he's just some kind of sugar daddy, some candy uncle who's just handing out candy and sweets and goodness all the time, as if God's only job in our life is making us thrilled with happiness and that there's never a trial or never a difficulty or that God is never working deep and painful things in our life. We don't have to present God that way. Number one, because it's not true. But number two, people now more than ever, they're looking for something real. We can be real about our relationship with God. We can be real about the joys and we can be real about the pains of our life with God. The earth will see that. They'll see what God has done and is doing and the glorious fruit that he brings out of it. They'll see what we proclaim at the end of verse 12. You have brought us out to rich fulfillment and they will praise the Lord as well. 
So now he's going to talk about his acting out of praise, verses 13, 14, and 15. Here we go. He says, I will go into your house with burnt offerings. I will pay your, you my vows, which my lips have uttered. And my mouth has spoken when I was in trouble. I will offer you burnt sacrifices of fat animals with the sweet aroma of rams. I will offer bulls with goats. Selah. Verse 13. Because God, you've been so good to me because I want to proclaim your goodness to all the earth. I'm going to go to your house, your temple, your tabernacle. I'm going to go to your house with burnt offerings offerings. I am determined to praise God by obeying his command regarding sacrifices and bringing them to the altar of God. Now, we obviously don't live under the same covenant that the psalmist lived under when he wrote Psalm 66. But he is acting out just that simple principle, Lord, you told me to bring these sacrifices. I'm going to bring them. By the way, you know that the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 12, that what we're to offer now unto God is our bodies as a living sacrifice unto him. And that's what we need to do. That's what we need to take very seriously, that we bring a living sacrifice unto God. He says in verse 13, I will pay you my vows. Uh, Apparently the psalmist had promised God certain sacrifices or gifts in gratitude for God's work when he was in trouble. He mentions the trouble in verse 14. And so he's not going to fail to bring those. That would be a sin to make a vow unto God and to not pay it. But instead he will. Look at what he says in verse 15. Burnt sacrifices of fat animals with sweet aroma of rams. I will offer bulls with goats. So he's going to fulfill his vows to God with generous, expensive sacrifices. He's going to offer multiple animals, rams, bulls, goats. And what he brought to God He was going to bring the best. They were fat animals, just super ripe for sacrifice and honoring to God. So now he continues on verse 16. Now addressing others here, he says, verses 16 through 19. Come in here, all you who fear God, and I will declare what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear, but certainly God has heard me. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. (laughs) I love this. It's as if he's come to the tabernacle or the temple. He's come to the altar there. He's made his sacrifices. And when that is all over, or even maybe where he is, while he is there at the altar of sacrifice, this is what he says. Verse 16, come in here. All you who fear God. You see, the vow of the psalmist was not fulfilled through sacrifices alone. He also had an obligation to proclaim God's goodness, to declare what he has done for my soul. His actions spoke, the the actions were the actions of sacrifice. But the speaking of his actions did not take away the need for his mouth to also speak. And this is what he's doing. It's as if he's right there at the altar. Or I like what Derek Kidner said about this. Let me just read you this quote from Derek Kidner. He says this quote, We may picture the scene of public worship, perhaps at Passover or at a victory celebration, in which the corporate praise gives way to the voice of this single worshiper who stands with his gifts before the altar and speaks of the God whose care is not only worldwide and nationwide, but personal. I will tell what he has done for me. And what has he done? Look at it there in verse 17. I cried to him with my mouth and he was extolled with my tongue. As the psalmist spoke to others about God's goodness, He described how he spoke to God. He offered both the sacrifice of animals and the sacrifice of praise. And then he says in verse 18, 18, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Now, what he's trying to make plain here is that no one should think that God could be persuaded merely through sacrifices or through vows. It was important to make clear that the psalmist did not only sacrifice, but he also gave God something better than sacrifice, obedience. He did not hold on 
to iniquity in his heart. No, he gave it up before God and confessed it. So therefore, he has the great confidence in verse 19. Certainly, God has heard me. When he cried out to God, God heard. God answered. God gave this psalmist even more reasons to praise him. So we're going to conclude the psalm now in verse 20. It's a beautiful conclusion. Ready for this? He says, and again, I, I picture him there. He's still standing at the altar sacrifice, maybe speaking to an assembled crowd. And this is what he proclaims. Blessed be God who has not turned away my prayer nor his mercy from me. Now, we often take the privilege of prayer for granted. The psalmist understood how wonderful it is that God received his prayer and how it made God even more to be praised. That's why he says, Blessed be God who has not turned away my prayer. You know, we would think that God has every reason to say, Nope, not going to receive your prayer today. No, nope, you weren't good enough today. No, nope, you weren't good enough yesterday. No, uh, for a week or two weeks, you're on probation. I'm not going to hear your prayers. That's not how God operates. And the psalmist praises God because of his mercy. That's why he says at the end there in verse 20, nor his mercy from me. That is a final and wonderful reminder that the answer to prayer did not come from what the psalmist deserved. The answer came as a gift from the great love and mercy, the chesed of God. What a beautiful, beautiful way to end the psalm. I like what Derek Kidner said on this. He said, The final word of gratitude is not for the answered request alone, but for what it signifies, an unbroken relationship with God. Now, I want to explain another thing to you here. Uh, It's suggested by a man named Thomas Fuller. He cited in Charles Spurgeon's commentary, The Treasury of David. He composed a syllogism, a logical argument, from verses 19 and 20 of Psalm 66. And it works something like this. Here's the syllogism. If I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear my prayer. That's in verse 19. God has heard my prayer. Now, you would expect the next line to be, therefore, there's no iniquity in my heart. I mean, isn't that kind of how the logic would lay out? If I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear my prayer. God has heard my prayer. Therefore, there's no iniquity in my heart. But that's not what the psalmist says. The psalmist completes the syllogism, the logical argument in an unexpected way. He praises the mercy of God. Here's his logic. If I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear my prayer. God has heard my prayer. Oh, what a merciful God I have. Isn't that great? I like what John Trapp said about that thinking. He said this, the old Puritan commentator said, this is the conclusion of the psalmist's syllogism in this and the two former verses. And herein, his logic is better than Aristotle's. (laughs) I like that, John Trapp. This is great heavenly logic. I'll run it through you one more time. Number one, if I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear my prayer. That's the if. The result is, God has heard my prayer. The conclusion is, therefore, God is so merciful to me. That is heavenly philosophy, heavenly logic in syllogism form. All right, before we leave Psalm 66, let's look for a few wonderful ways that this beautiful psalm points to Jesus. You ready for this? Okay, number one, it reminds us that all God's enemies will submit to Jesus Christ. Now, we saw this back in verse 3, and I mentioned it there. I'm just going to mention it again. Verse 3 says this, Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you. And again, Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, has something of this sense in reference to Jesus Christ, where it says that at the name of Jesus, Every knee shall bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All God's enemies will submit to Jesus Christ. What is proposed in verse 3 
is beautifully and powerfully fulfilled in Jesus. What a beautiful way that Psalm 66 points to Jesus. But that's just the first. I've got a couple more. Secondly, Jesus is the ultimate one who was tested and brought out to rich fulfillment. Verse 10 says this, You, O God, have tested us. And verse 12 continues, We went through fire and through water, but you brought us out to rich fulfillment. Now, let me just say, Jesus was tested more than any human being who has ever walked this earth. And he was brought out to rich fulfillment more than any other human being who has walked this earth. There's never a person as tested as Jesus of Nazareth. And there was never a person as fulfilled filled and rewarded as Jesus of Nazareth. So verses 10, 11, and 12, they point us to Jesus. Now, finally, Jesus is the one whose prayers were always perfectly heard and answered. Verse 18 says this, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Okay, we got that back in verse 18. Now, Jesus never sinned. He never once regarded iniquity in his heart. So his prayers were always heard and answered. Now, I put that in the past. His prayers were always heard and answered. Let me give you the glorious truth. The prayers of Jesus Christ are always heard and answered. And here's good news for you. In the New Testament letter to the Hebrews, it tells us that Jesus lives forever to pray for his people, to make intercession for them. Jesus Christ is praying for his people. If you are numbered among the people of God, Jesus is praying for you. Aren't you happy that someone whose prayers are always answered is praying for you and will continue to do that? What beautiful ways that Psalm 66 points us to Jesus and what a great reminder it is for us about the ways that we can and should praise God. Let me conclude with prayer in light of these things. Father, thank you. Sometimes we need very practical instruction on how we should praise God. And we thank you that this psalm, Psalm 66, gives us that practical instruction. So we want to sing. We want to sing with honor to you. We want to declare your praises. We want to trust you even in the difficult times. We want to proclaim it to the world. We we want to fulfill the sacrifices that you give us to fulfill all these things, God. But most of all, We want to put our focus and our praise on the person and work of Jesus Christ. Thank you for all your goodness to us. And thank you for speaking to us through wonderful psalms like Psalm 66. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.